Thank you, Alex, and thank you uh, to Conmet, and um, uh, also congratulations, uh, Clara, to this uh, great um, um, innovative uh, talk. So posterior instability, um, of course, a um, little bit less common, uh, in some ways similar to anterior instability, but also, like Alex already said, in a lot of ways uh, different. Um, so I'm going to go over some uh, specific details that I think are important if you have to treat this type of patients. Uh, first of all, posterior instability is really a posterior inferior uh, instability, and that has to do with the fact that just like on the anterior parts, the coracoid is in the way, in the posterior parts, the spine of the scapula is in the way. So if the, the shoulder dislocates posteriorly, it's really more, more posterior inferior, and that is important when you uh, start treating this type of patients. Another important thing is that I have to, you have to realize is that for posterior instability, a lot of these patients have a multidirectional laxity uh, that is not always symptomatic, but it's on top of, uh, of, their, of their problem. And I think it's important if you start uh, treating them uh, that you can classify the, them in what I uh, believe there are uh, three important um, classes. There's the, the typical recurrent posterior instability without hyperlaxity and unintentional. And I think that's, that's the best uh, group. There is also a group uh, that you don't want to treat surgically. And that's of course, uh, this type of guys uh, that have really uh, intentional um, so, uh, instability with hyperlaxity and all sort of scapula thoracic um, um, problems. And then there's a third group, which is a little bit in between, uh, which is the positional posterior instability. And I think we can discuss about that a little bit more. I think there's some indication to do uh, surgery on these ones. Um, all for, for the physical examination, uh, I think we all know the, the posterior the jerk test where you stabilize the scapula and we, where you move the arm from a deduction to a deduction, and you can really um, um, see how that goes, but that's very painful and, and not very uh, easy to do. So I think it's yeah. important if you if you examine your patients um, before they they go uh, on the lateral decubitus, you have to examine them under uh, anesthesia, and you can really clearly um, um, replicate their instability. Like this one is out, and now is back in. Uh, so that's that's quite clear. And I think it's important to test that before you go to your surgery. Of course, uh, before the surgery, imaging is important. I think that's quite the same as in um, in uh, anterior instability. It depends on where you work or what your radiologist does best. I think R2 CT and R2 MRI are both good. For R2 CT, it's it's a little bit better for the labrum pathology uh, to see some retro uh, version of the glenoid dysplasia. Uh, on the other hand, r MRI is just a better, better full picture, and sometimes you'll find some associate lesions as well. Uh, just like I said, hyper hyperlaxity is often uh, there, and sometimes it's the only finding. Um, widened rotator interval, uh, not so obvious, but if you look at your patients, take a look at the, cap the posterior capsule, you will find in a lot of patients just capsular redundancy, like in this one, with um, truly symptomatic posterior instability. And then also uh, be careful for associate lesions, like in this one, this patient had a posterior instability um, with uh, afterwards an important atrophy because of an, uh, an associated uh, spinal glenoid um, cyst. So coming back to the, the typical pathology, uh, of course, uh, arthroscopy helps you best in finding uh, the typical um, uh, pathology. This is looking from the posterior uh, superior Portal. This is the typical uh, posterior bankart lesion. I would say this is the the best or the ideal situation. This is what you like to see when you go for a repair, um, just like on the anterior side. You can also um, and don't forget to look at this. And this uh, is done from the anterior superior portal. Look for um, um, reverse hill sex lesions uh, because they can actually be quite big. I think they're not so important as in anterior instability. They're usually on track, but definitely uh, look uh, at them and make sure that uh, you don't miss them because once in a while they can be uh, quite big and quite uh, medial. Um, in some cases, you will just find a posterior capsular tear or a posterior haggle. It's uh, it's uncommon, but uh, it can be uh, it can be the case. And just arthroscopy is perfect to see that. Uh, you can also find posterior bony bank art uh, lesions with uh, really bony avulsions. I think those are also good. Uh, wants to uh, to fix arthroscopically, bone to bone heals better than uh, soft tissue to bone. So I think that's not a contraindication. And then in some cases you'll see 
uh, just like on the anterior, on the anterior instability, some reverse GLAD lesions. Uh, this can be traumatic uh, in some cases, but it can also be uh, in, in, um, in more in the story of an, of an onset of early osteoarthritis. And these are, in my hands, uh, probably uh, not, so not the best indications for surgery. Um, so if you do treat them, arthroscopy is uh, the best uh, way to approach them. Um, this can go just uh, to a uh, capsulography if it's just hyperlaxity or labral repair. Uh, I think definitely just like in uh, anterior instability, we need to reconstruct the full sling uh, because if it's, tear, if it's torn on the, on the posterior side, it's probably stretched on the anterior side. And this is where the interval discussion comes to, um, to the podium. And we can talk about that, it's controversial. And then in some cases, uh, there also are uh, indications where you need to bring bone uh, when, it's, uh, when the, the bone loss is too important. Uh, conventional techniques, when I was uh, still a resident long time ago, we used to do this with uh, two posterior cannulas, uh, which is quite a challenge. This is looking from uh, antero superior. And you, as you can see, there are two uh, cannulas in place, which is, that, which is not easy in that uh, part of the shoulder. It's, it's more difficult than in the anterior part. Uh, we used to do two to three cannulas uh, in total, uh, used suture anchors, metallic in the beginning, bioabsorbable uh, peak, and so on. But with all uh, these type of anchors, we did see some uh, complications over the years. And I think you know them definitely metallic are completely abandoned. Um, res resorbable can uh, cause problems like synovitis and, uh, and, 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 and cystic formation. And also the peak ones, if you're not uh, careful and you, uh, you put them a little bit too proud, they can cause huge problems. And I think with the new of suture, suture anchors, uh, depending on what you do, even anterior or posterior instability, I think this is, for me, uh, the best way to go. It's There is less bone removal, so uh, you can put more fixation points, it's more precise, and it's so much better to the tissue. So that's, for me, my preferred technique. So this is uh, how I uh, fix a posterior labrum tear. So like I said, the patient is in, in lateral decubitus, and I'm looking from the antero superior portal. I would call it a skybox view. I'm palpating. Uh, through the, the, the posterior uh, portal, and there is one cannula in the posterior inferior uh, portal, as you can see. And then it's just typically the same thing as in an anterior bank card. You use an, uh, an, 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 an instrument that you like, and I think the spectrum is perfect for that to grab a lot of posterior inferior capsule. Like I said in the beginning, it's posterior inferior instability. You need to grab the posterior inferior part of that capsule um, and, and um, get it done. And then to introduce uh, the, the cannula, you need that other angle. You cannot come into that, uh, that other portal. And what we do now is we use the, the trans um, or the percutaneous technique where we bring in this uh, guide uh, through the Wilmington portal, which is just posterolateral. We bring it through the skin, through the musculotendinous junction of the infraspinatus, and then right on the, on the right spot. This is on the right shoulder. So this is at seven o'clock position. And as you can see, you can um, cl uh, closely watch what you're doing. You bring in uh, the all suture suture anchor, uh, just like you do an anterior bank art repair, just on the rim of uh, the posterior glenoid. Um, always uh, make sure that you're stable, that you're um, well uh, fixed in the bone. Uh, pull, in, pull on it, don't be afraid. You rather have uh, um, a loose uh, anchor now than in the, in the rehab. Uh, but it's usually very, very stable. It's uh, in, in my hands, it's at least as stable as, an, as a typical suture anchor. So that's why I like it. And then you can uh, suture manage like you do in, an, um, in a classic bank art repair, just from the posterior side, still looking from the antero superior side, using the working posterior inferior portal, and then uh, putting a lot of uh, nice um, Stitches, uh, try to uh, put the stitch away from the cartilage, exactly like in the bank repair. So that's the, this type of sutures do not abrade uh, the cartilage of the glenoids or the, at least the humeral heads. Uh, so I put them uh, away and I keep my drill guides in place because that's my small cannula, um, uh, exactly like we used to use big cannulas. This one is percutaneously and this is now my, my other cannula. I, use, I keep it in place and I can put in one, two, three, four uh, anchors uh, at, um, um, so without any problems, without um, fighting uh, one kind of against the other. So same thing, uh, 
uh, one that is a little bit higher. I think same thing as in the anterior instability, I use uh, at least three anchors. I think it's important to put um, many uh, suture points. That's been shown in the literature as well for anterior instability, and it's not different for uh, a posterior uh, labrum repair. So same thing here. So this is the end, um, three um, stitches um, just uh, exactly here. This is gonna be the third one uh, all the way to the top. So this is about at um, 11 o'clock. As you can see, this guy has also some cartilage lesions um, as well. Um, and then um, finally, um, just like in anterior instability, but even much less co more uh, less common are, um, are um, problems for um, to treat with bone block procedure. In some cases, the posterior capsule will just not be enough um, to stabilize the shoulder. Uh, sometimes the quality of the posterior capsule is, is not good enough. Um, patients with glenoid bone loss and also contact sports, I think, um, can be um, indicated for a bone block procedure. I think we all learned them uh, to do open, and I find them extremely difficult. I think uh, the discussion in the anterior part is still open, but for the posterior uh, <clears throat> bone block, the posterior approach, and getting a good view on the articular surface of the glenoids is really not easy. And I think these are just uh, ideal to do arthroscopic. It's the same type of approach. You look from the anterior portal, you bring in the, um, you, you prepare exactly the same as you do for a uh, posterior labrum repair. And then you bring in the bone block from posterior and you fix it uh, with whatever you like. This ones were done with screws, but uh, there are many other types of uh, fixation possible. And then you can uh, fix the, the soft tissue over the bone block uh, if, there, if there is any. Um, left. So thanks, and um, I'm ready for your uh, questions.